Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is James Corbett, publisher of thecorbettreport.com and editorial writer for the International Forecaster. He's speaking to us from Japan. Welcome back to the show, James. Thank you so much for having me on. Always a pleasure to be here. So what's making the front page news in the Japanese uh, financial papers right now? Well, I think the overall uh, top story at the moment is the impending conspiracy bill that the Abe government is uh, getting set to run through government one way or another by hook or by crook, which will outlaw not crimes, but thought crimes, essentially. People who are uh, suspected of planning to commit a crime of some sort are going to be uh, able to be locked up for a good long while. And that is uh, in preparation for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. They want to be able to thwart any p- possible terrorist threats before they come. So that's quite the, the biggest political story at the moment. But uh, financially, uh, there's uh, not a lot of happy news at the moment, uh, uh, despite the fact that late last year there were some there were some bright spots in uh, the, the financial forecasts for Japan with a pickup in exports and investment into the country. Uh, that shine is definitely wearing off at this point. A spate of bad news in recent months in, or recent weeks, including uh, around middle of February, we got the news that uh, J- uh, Japan's economic growth had slowed again, and that it by Q4 of 2016, according to the numbers that have just been released, uh, annualized uh, growth was 1%, pretty anemic in and of itself. But then uh, just a couple of days ago, we got the latest factory uh, output uh, output um, reports, and it's even worse than expected. In fact, they were expecting a 0.4% expansion in factory activity uh, in January. Uh, that apparently, once the numbers were crunched, equated to a 0.8% contraction. So uh, the economy is not doing well here. And I think primarily the primary driver behind this is continuing anemic consumer spending, which accounts for half of Japan's GDP. But the Japanese public is just not opening their wallets. And I don't think that's very surprising because as much as Abenomics has done wonders for the stock market and for corporate profits. It's done almost nothing in terms of real wages here. The average uh, working stiff in Japan is, if not uh, much better off, uh, perhaps no better off than they were before Abe got into power at all. So uh, the consumer continues to basically shut their wallet down, and that is continuing to strangle uh, the Japanese economy. And on top of all that, uh, once again, uh, Japan has uh, started posting trade deficits as a result of uh, contracting, um, not, not only contracting factory activity, but of course the, uh, the export knockoffs on that, especially contractions in the uh, passenger vehicle market. Uh, the car industry is not doing so well these days. So not a lot of happy news, unfortunately, for Japan. How do you get Japanese consumers to spend when they have low wages and if they put their money in the bank, they don't get any interest on it? Well, uh, that is one of the reasons they're supposed to be going out and spending, right? Because if you put them, park the money in the bank, then you're going to lose it. So you might as well spend it on something today and, you know, get more of that value. But that is, that has not eventuated in people actually getting out there and spending in the economy. And really, I mean, I think it's just a, uh, I'm, I'm not even sure it's a comedy of errors so much as just, uh, the, the, the quite obvious and com- completely predictable result of things like, uh, uh, raising the the uh, the consumption tax here from five percent to eight percent, as the uh, Abe government did a, a couple of years ago, right in the face of this flagging uh, consumer spending. And of course, what we saw in the run up to that uh, increase in taxation was a people front loading a bunch of purchases uh, at the five percent rate before the eight percent kicked in, and then. Consumer spending dropped off a cliff after the uh, the tax was raised, and the plan, of course, is to raise the consumption tax even further to ten percent. Now that has been planned for the very near future, but it's 
very likely that that will be delayed um, by a year or two years or however long it takes before the government realizes that raising taxes may be the wrong way to go. But of course, they're also up against the brick wall of the uh, the debt problem, the the uh, uh, the ab- absolutely astronomical levels of debt here in Japan, the highest in the developed world, and. To some extent, I mean, uh, there's a number of different factors that go into this, but one of the interesting takes that I saw recently was Kevin Drum writing in Mother Jones, who was pointing out the demographic factors behind Japan's stagnation. It has often been pointed out that since the bubble pop in 1990, there has, of course, been almost three decades now of uh, anemic growth, to say the least, in the Japanese economy. But a part of that has to be down to demographics, because when you look at real GDP growth, over the last 20 years, you'll see that the USA for the American economy, for example, has grown 68% since uh, 1994, 1995 levels. Uh, Japan growth in that period is 23%. So it seems quite obvious that the uh, American economy has been growing much more substantially. But when you break it down to real GDP per working age uh, population, in fact, the Japanese economy is doing even better than the U.S. A real GDP per working age adult has grown 39% over that time period in Japan, 36% in America. And th- what this really tells us is there is a significant underlying demographic trend here that is a, a fundamental anchor on the Japanese economy right now. Um, working age population has been decreasing here since 1997. The elderly population has been increasing a, increasing apace. And now the overall population is shrinking as there are more people dying here in Japan than being born. And all of that adds up to an economy that seems to be in permanent decline. Uh, Other than a demographic change, it's difficult to see what could possibly really get the uh, Japanese economy to take off again. Well, Japan's anti-immigration, and are they doing anything to encourage young people to have kids? Uh, there are various government programs and incentives in different prefectures here. Usually at the prefectural level, there are different stimulus and incentives and different uh, child uh, support uh, that, that people can get. Um, but in terms of a coordinated plan to really get people having children, uh, it's not even uh, – it's it's – Partly economic, of course, but it's also partly cultural, and it's difficult to imagine that the government is going to be able to fundamentally change that, uh, turn that around. Um, One-child policies and the like may be effective in getting um, demographics to the point where you have a shrinking population, but um, uh, it's difficult to see the government really mandating a multiple-child policy and making that work. So I'm not sure that's something that the government will really ultimately have the control over. I think the number one thing would be to get uh, the the economy turned around. But again, as I say, part of the problem is the demographics itself. So it's almost a self-sustaining problem, which uh, I'm not sure there is a government magic solution to. Does uh, Japan accept refugees? There are some refugees here, but certainly in terms of uh, the countries in the world for whom uh, that Jap- that refugees would think about going to, Japan would be very far down that list, not only because of its geographical distance from most of the uh, countries that are uh, having the, the problems that are exporting refugees right now, but also because of their very unfriendly, shall we say, refugee policies, which make it not a prime def- destination for refugees. So there are some in the country, but very, very few, and uh, no sign that that's going to change anytime soon. And in terms of legal immigration, Again, there has been a lot of talk in recent years about the need for trying to expand the avenues for legal immigration into Japan in order to increase the working population here, but very little political support for that uh, amongst the populace and very little political activity from the government to actually make that happen. We'll have more with James Corbett right after the break. I'm Bill McWilliam, president of Cascadero Copper, CCD on the TSX Venture Exchange. Cesium is one of the world's rarest metals with a growing industrial demand. Drilling is underway on our Tehran property in Argentina to prove up a cesium resource. Cascadero's patent-pending leach process has the potential to make Cascadero the lowest-cost supplier of cesium in the world. Visit our website, cascadero.com, or phone us at 604-924-5504. 
I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're speaking with James Corbett. James, the war of words between Donald Trump and China, what kind of tensions is that developing, or is it more of a story here in North America than in Asia? Well, it's certainly a story here, but it really does remain to be seen what this ultimately means, because I think if we know anything by now, it's that uh, a lot of heat and light will be generated from the discourse and the tweets coming out of the Trump administration, but not so much actual um, policy um, change per se. So it, it it is yet to be seen exactly what that means in terms of relations. And of course, I think famously, uh, 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 Xi Jinping refused to talk to Trump until he reaffirmed the U.S. one China policy, i.e. Taiwan and China are one and the same. And and in Beijing's eyes, it all belongs to Beijing. And of course, uh, it, that's exactly what happened. Um, uh, Trump did reaffirm that policy and and uh, Xi Jinping did deign to allow him to talk to him again. So that was an interesting development. But again, it, I think it's too early to really tell what that means uh, on the bigger terms of U.S.-Chinese relations, but something that is becoming apparent and a surprisingly in-depth uh, in and interesting uh, article from Roger Yu in USA Today that was just published uh, yesterday is uh, called China Eyes Global Leadership as U.S. Turns Inward. And it goes through the various infrastructure spending projects that China is uh, financing abroad via its Export-Import Bank of China and other funding mechanisms. For example, the 300-mile railway that is now um, being uh, constructed in East Africa connecting Nairobi to Mombasa, which is being financed, again, by the Export-Import Bank of China. Uh, it's a $13.8 billion project that's going to cut the travel time from Nairobi to Mombasa down from 12 hours to 4 hours. It's a pretty significant development, and that, again, is being financed by China, not out of some altruism, uh, they, they care about the people of the planet per se, but because it will obviously help Chinese interests to have um, more advanced infrastructure to transport things to the main shipping port of Mombasa uh, in the African continent where China is heavily invested. But it is a win-win for everyone involved. Uh, China obviously gets economic benefit from it, but obviously the, the people of Africa benefit from the infrastructure. And that's just one example of foreign direct investment that China has um, invested outwardly uh, to the tune of $187.8 billion in 2015, which is, of course, a record for China and a 52% increase from 2014. And those numbers are only set to increase as we have the nearly $1 trillion that has been earmarked for the China One Belt, One Road policy. So we really are seeing a new age of Chinese direct investment in foreign, uh, well, foreign markets, really, to put the, the right spin on it, because, of course, again, this is about ultimately China improving its own economic uh, condition. But at the same time, there is significant infrastructure development going on in these countries. And I think that portends the potential real bellwether change of, uh, of, of roles that is taking place as the U.S. potentially, at least in terms of its rhetoric, starts turning more inward and China starts turning more outward with its, uh, its investment in various places. And that could really be the fundamental difference, barring, of course, some sort of drastic move about tariff increases and things that really put the damper on the Chinese economy and prevent them from taking that role uh, in terms of infrastructure spending abroad. Trump, of course, says uh, he's all for fair trade. China does have a lot of limitations on foreign investment. Do you see them easing those uh, uh, restrictions? I think there has to be uh, some degree of liberalization of the economy taking place uh, if they do want to continue participating in the various ventures that they're participating in. But then again, uh, it really does depend on what types of punitive measures are taken. And of course, um, China will undoubtedly protest any and all sanctions. And there are increasing, at least increasing talk of sanctions, not only from the U.S., but from uh, the U.K. and the EU in general. Um, and it will have a significant economic downturn on China if that does go ahead. So I think they are certainly 
they are um, they, it is in their interest to play ball in uh, certain ways, and part of that would obviously be the liberalization of the economy. Remains to be seen whether that will take place and in what uh, fashion. But the lip service now is that China is going to be taking its uh, uh, taking the foot off of the gas pedal when it comes to credit and fiscal stimulus as the driver for economic growth, and they're at least giving lip service to uh, it boosting aggregate demand. Uh, uh, rather than continuing to try to use stimulus to to improve the economy. And that might be a signal of the fact that China is looking towards the turning around of the ship of state to away from a export-dependent economy towards a more consumer-based uh, economy, more like, for example, as I say in Japan, where half of GDP growth comes from the, uh, the consumer spending public. Uh, I think China would like to try to replicate something like that rather than depending so heavily on exports and on the types of trade deals that have allowed them to become this global giant. Um, again, it remains to be seen how successful they are in that venture, though. How is the Chinese real estate market doing? That is an excellent question. And I'm going to admit I haven't kept my eye on that this week, so I can't give you any of uh, the latest updates. But uh, as people know, China has had problems in recent years trying to uh, to maintain uh, rates, uh, ch- uh, real estate uh, property levels in in a- anywhere the universe of what uh, would be avail- uh, available and affordable to uh, to its own citizens as it attempts one of the largest relocations in history, trying to get uh, a millions of uh, of uh, Chinese rural. Uh, 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 peasants, uh, essentially, to migrate into the urban locations. Uh, it has been a struggle to try to maintain property rates um, within their their grasp. So uh, that remains an ongoing problem. And um, there's, of course, the the flip side of that is the newly minted millionaires of uh, the Chinese, the burgeoning Chinese uh, uh, industrial economic class who are looking to try to invest in real estate elsewhere. And of course, again, that's something that we've talked about quite a bit in relation to Vancouver and other property markets in Canada. Where are they putting their money? I mean, Vancouver put in a 15% foreign buyer tax, but other places haven't. Uh, is billionaire money still fleeing from China despite strong currency controls or attempted control? Well, I think attempted is the right word there. And yes, it is, I think, still fleeing. And I think a lot of it is going in, is still going into U.S. And, China and Canadian markets via a number of routes that uh, are obviously not uh, allowed by uh, official Chinese regulators. But still, there are always cracks in the system and people always tend to find those cracks when they are sufficiently monetarily motivated to do so. So um, that is continuing to go on. And in fact, uh, the latest uh, numbers out just uh, at the end of last month from um, Pensions and Investments Online indicate that Chinese investors accounted for almost half of the $60 billion in investments in overseas real estate last year by Asian investors. And that's up 28% from 2015. So not only are real estate investors from China, or really Chinese people looking to get their money out of China, uh, continuing to invest in real estate overseas, they're doing so in even higher rates than before. We'll have more with James Corbett right after this. Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa, located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. Keep informed. Receive our weekly recap of thought-provoking articles, podcasts, and radio delivered to your inbox for free. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage, HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with James Corbett. James, apparently India still has the fastest-growing economy in Asia despite their, their crackdown on cash What's the driving force behind the Indian economy? The fact they have a lot of young people? Uh, I think that certainly, again, yes, demographics definitely does play into it. And again, I think um, uh, uh, India has been set to be a uh, driver of global economic growth for a long time. It's uh, generally been a question of uh, government stifling of that economic potential. And uh, perhaps this is a, a sign of 
the the gas uh, the gas pedal being pushed to the bottom of the floor. Um, and uh, just to follow up on what you're saying there, uh, the latest numbers show that uh, GDP was up seven uh, percent in uh, the fourth quarter of 2016. So. Uh, it's slower than the previous quarter, which was 7.4%, but still a very, very large growth. And uh, uh, considering, again, just the mass demographic uh, factor of the world's largest democracy, as they say, um, that's still a significant um, um, economic expansion. And as you say, that's in the face of the drag on the, that economic expansion that was caused by the uh, the harebrained way in which this uh, uh, cash crisis was uh, rolled out by um, the Narendra Modi administration just a couple of months ago. So that is a pretty impressive figure. And it shows that there is, uh, I I think, still a huge amount of potential in India in terms of uh, really perhaps even surprising, uh, surpassing China as the driver of global growth in the coming years. Well, one analyst told me, What's holding India back is its incredible red tape and bureaucracy. On the other hand, they're a democracy where ideas are encouraged, whereas in China they lead from the top down. I think that would be uh, certainly part of it. And uh, there is a uh, healthy degree of uh, political debate and discourse that goes on in Indian in the Indian uh, political arena. Um, so it will it, it will be interesting to see what political effect uh, the the cash crisis had on Modi uh, the Modi government and whether that will actually have a demonstrable effect at the polls. But I think uh, India is absolutely famous for its red tape bureaucratic nonsense and rigmarole that uh, citizens have to go through, which is why it was really no surprise that uh, the the uh, uh, the demonetization of the 500 and 1,000 rupee notes turned out into to be such a debacle when it really didn't have to be. It could have been prepared a, a lot more um, uh, smoothly, and it could have been rolled out uh, in a more uh, well-planned fashion, shall we say, but it was done quite a, a spur of the moment, and it, it even caught many of the printers who were printing the new notes by surprise, who they thought they had months more to prepare for it. So, again, that's just another example of uh, government bungling of something that could have gone a lot more smoothly, but uh, a- again, I think the 7% growth rate shows that there is uh, still incredible economic potential in India, despite the government's best efforts to strangle that growth. James, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it. My guest has been James Corbett, publisher of the CorbettReport.com, editorial writer for the International Forecaster. He was speaking to us from Japan, where he has worked and lived since 2004. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. If you have any questions for the show, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.